and DNA that gets put down in the little tiny holes uh -huh. inside this um, slab of gelatin-like stuff, the DNA migrates towards this uh, positive charge. But the things that are small can migrate quickly, because it's like this, at the molecular level, this agarose is a big whole mesh of openings uh, with the chains of the gel in between it. Well, if it's a small DNA molecule, it can squeeze through these little holes pretty quickly. If it's a big molecule, it keeps kind of getting hung up. And so this is a way to separate. The small molecules will move quickly and move further down the gel. The big molecules will move slowly and not move so far. Wow. So after a while, you can see pan patterns to say, oh, I've got a band right here. This is where there's a particular chunk of large DNA. Here's a chunk of small DNA down here. And it's... It, you know, a complicated way to make something that's invisible visible to us, which is to say we have this whole mix of different DNA molecules, but we know that the one we want is a particular size. Well, this lets us filter it and let the small ones, well, those are too, moving too fast, we don't want those. Get rid of those guys. Here's big ones, well, let's leave those behind, but here's exactly the band we want. You know, so it's a way that we can either just see what's present or if we don't want to just know it's there, but we actually want to recover it, we can even some, you know, literally slice it out of the gel and purify it. And now instead of a mix of a whole bunch of different DNAs, we've got just a DNA fragment we want. Did you use this for the gut bacteria? I, I wound up using this as part of that study. Uh, how was it? Part? How did you use it for part of that? So, the steps that I went through uh, started from stool samples from people that had agreed to take the antibiotic. Uh, I extracted DNA from whatever was present in the, in the poop sample, basically. Okay. And mostly that's bacterial DNA. There will be some human cells in there as well, but bacteria are abundant in healthy stool. And so I used chemical technique and heat. I had things almost boiling hot. And basically the cell walls, the cell membrane just kind of bust open. So now everything that was inside the cell is now leaking out all over the place. Okay. And then I used chemical methods to separate deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, you guys the got stuff that? that our genes are made of. <laughs> gotcha. I, I use these chemical methods to just pull the DNA out and hold on to it and just kind of wash all the rest of the stuff away. So now instead of having a whole bunch of different bacterial cells mixed in here in the stool sample, now I've got the DNA from a whole bunch of different bacteria mixed gotcha. up in a, in a test tube. Well, somewhere along that DNA, in every one of the the chromosomes for a bacteria, they've got one or a couple of genes that encode a very specific protein. Uh, well, it's actually not a, a protein, it's a the component of a ribosome, which is the essential part of a cell. All okay. cells have it. So there's a gene for a part of this called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And that is the identity card we use. It just turns out because all bacteria have this, the sequence is similar enough that we can always recognize it and find it, Okay. but it's different enough that it'll be different for one bacterium than another. Gotcha. So it works great as a, just like a standard government ID card. Everyone's got their driver's license or their ID card. They should, theoretically, if they're old enough. Don't leave home without it if you're yeah. driving. Uh, you know, so instead of one person having you know, his utility bill and a second person having a birth certificate from a different country and a third person having a driver's license. You know, we ask for a standard ID. Everyone's, you know, ask for the driver's license. Um, we're asking for the sequence of a particular gene, 16S gene. So that's our standard ID and the different gene sequence on that standard gene tells us, oh, this is a Escherichia coli bacterium. Oh, this is a lactobacillus bacterium. Oh, this is a different bacterium. This must have come from a you know, Fecalibacterium prosnitzii. And so that's what we want is to check these ID cards. But what we've got is all the DNA mixed together. Well, what we can do is use some of these um, enzyme-based -based techniques to go down and just find the ID card buried within all these this DNA, make a gazillion copies of just that, and again, wash away all that mix of all the different genes, all the DNA from all the cells, and we're left just with the, all these copies of ID cards. Gotcha. 
And now we separate those out, we can separate them out and get just that fragment we want. And we run, again, complicated machines that are based on these enzymes. We don't run them in the lab because it's basically they're big fancy techniques, specialized operators. It's better for us just to pay someone else to run these machines for us. But those are the things that then tell us, ah, this ID card has this sequence. Okay. And they'll give us, you know, a string of a few hundred letters uh, that represent these four different molecules, A's, T's, G's, and C's, adenines, you know, thymidines, guanidines, cytosines, in a particular order. And we look at that and say, oh, well, that's an order that looks like this bacterium or that bacterium. Uh, but at one stage in the process, mm -hmm. we need to uh, separate out the little fragments we want. And I use a gel essentially just like this to do that stuff. So when it was the beginning of the study, mm -hmm. before any antibiotics had been given to the, it was the three patients, mm -hmm. you took stool samples for, was it, I forget what it was, was it a month? A couple you, of months. A couple I, of months. Yeah, you know, I started started with one sample a month, and then I went up to one sample a week, and then I was even asking for samples daily. Okay. For the last week before people started on antibiotics. Okay. We don't know that much about just sort of the normal temporal fluctuations in the community. What would, did you find? Well, tell me if I'm understanding this study correct. It seemed like there were. In fact, like even sometimes day-to-day -day fluctuations in the the, um, the average kind of homeostasis level, or I don't even know what you want to call it, yeah. but what the bacteria well, was doing. Just the composition of the community. Okay. So, I mean, picture some ecosystem out there, Pick whether that's, you know, the Sierra foothills or the coastal ocean or the Amazon rainforest. You got a bunch of different types of critters that live there, and depending on what month or what year you go look, you may find pretty much the same list of critters, Okay. but some new ones, some different ones. Sometimes you'll, there'll be, you know, uh, a bloom of certain uh, plankton in the ocean in one month, but not the next month. Like the red uh, tide situation, yeah. might, something like that. So you'll see, you'll see some organisms that are not there sometimes, other times they are there. Even the ones that are there every time, sometimes they become more abundant or less abundant. Okay. So you've got just normally, naturally, fluctuations in the composition of the community. Gotcha. Some strains, some species become more abundant or less abundant. They become highly abundant in some situations, but then they're absent most of the time. And this, this and is so even with this is, this is normal, just normal people, yeah. you every day, you know, the average eating Joe. whatever, you know, some people don't eat exactly the same thing every day, but people's diet is usually pretty consistent. Sure. And, um, but whatever the sources of variability are, we do see just sort of some level of variation. Some things change a little bit. But in general, both from this study and, and from previous studies, the conventional wisdom is that the changes that happen day to day in my community are not so big that they'd ever mistake the community that I've got from the community you've got. We've well, okay. each got a personalized microbiota in our gut. A sample from you is going to be different from a sample from me today, tomorrow, next week, it doesn't matter when we look. Your temporal fluctuations are not going to make yours so different from what it normally is that it'll look like mine. Gotcha. Just the way, like, you wouldn't you wouldn't mistake the coastal ocean sample that you get from Monterey Bay. You wouldn't ever think that that was from... Caribbean Carolina. or whatever. Yeah. Is it a similar idea to fingerprints? No two yeah. fingerprints are the same? Yeah. It might is. look very, very similar, but... People if you're a scientist, talked about that, then you're looking at them. You use the composition of your gut microbes as a fingerprint, as a gotcha. way to identify somebody. So and I, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but, but it's, even, it's like um, that. Yeah. Two family members, two brother, a brother and sister from the same parents, when they're born? When they're born, they start sterile, and then they, the community in their gut develops over time. Uh, it seems, th this, this isn't completely understood, but it, it seems as though... Initially, there's a lot of fluctuation and variation, a lot of change in that community. There's a certain group of bacteria that dominate when babies are breastfed, okay. especially when that's the only thing they're eating. But you see lots of other bacteria just kind of pop up and get abundant and then go away again. And it's as babies start to eat solid food and then eventually...